Hello, oh, and welcome to our flipped classroom. As we discussed on Tuesday, this week we'll be focusing on gender equity. On Tuesday, I asked you all to think about what this term meant to you and if it was the same as gender equality. We talked a little bit about that, determined that the terms are not the same. Um, one way to really think about this, a great example given in one of my classes, was that if you think of the picture of three kids at a fence trying to look over and see a baseball game, um, gender or equity for those kids would be the tallest kid would have no box because they can already see over the fence. The middle kid would have one box to make sure they could see over the fence. And the shortest kid would have two boxes to make sure they could see over the fence. So in that way, everyone gets what they need to be able to see over the fence. If we're talking um, equality, that would mean that all kids had one box, but that still would not mean that some of the kids could see over the fence. So equality and equity are not the same. We're going to look at several examples today and kind of explore this topic a little bit more in depth. So to do that, let me go ahead and I'm going to flip to our next slide. We're going to look at gender equity and the brain. Um, I kind of alluded to this on Tuesday that gender equity is something that's kind of instilled in us from a very young um, childhood, this idea of gender and what it means. So I'm going to show you a video here and as you watch the video, I want you to jot down some notes on a blank sheet of paper. Um, remember, these notes are going to be used later on to write your one paragraph reflection that you'll turn in on Tuesday. So as you write your notes, maybe think about key concepts or insights or maybe new learnings you've gained as you watch the video. So to go to that, I'm going to escape out of this and head into our um, videos here. So click over. Let's over for a second. And here are our videos. So the first video is going to be looking at uh, gender equity and the brain. So take a moment to kind of watch through this, reflect on it as you hear and listen to our presenter. waiting for my flight two days ago at San Francisco International Airport and sitting directly across from me was a young attractive woman. She wore heavy makeup and she had long lacquered nails and a skimpy top that was riding up just enough to reveal a pretty gaudy belly piercing. So I had a shock of surprise when she stood up to board her flight and I saw the title of the book that she had been engrossed in all this time, Fundamentals of Angel Investing. So this was deliciously ironic for me because my topic is bias. I graduated uh, with a science degree from UC Berkeley in 1984. And it was hard studying science at Berkeley. And it wasn't just because of the content. I was the target of frequent, undeniable, in-my-face sexism. But this was also a time of celebration and optimism for women. We were the first generation in history where female college graduates outnumbered males. We were flooding into the marketplace in unprecedented numbers and into fields where before we'd had little to no representation. And we naively thought that our generation would be the one to make gender inequity a thing of the past. But here we are, it's 30 years later. And the conversation remains much the same. Young female scientists tell me stories that are heartbreakingly similar to those early experiences. We still have a substantial pay gap and shockingly few women at the top. Only 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women and 18% of Congress. Oddly, we are 51% of the population, yet occupy only 15% of lead roles in movies. In my world, Silicon Valley, is one of the few places where you might encounter this scene at a major conference during the bathroom break. <laughs> so as a woman, I find it disheartening and angering and really, frankly, boring to still be in this conversation. And I imagine as a man, it gets old having the finger always pointing back at you. 
The tolerance for this conversation is wearing thin, and this is nowhere more evident than in the insult-laden, often vulgar, and sometimes violent comment streams accompanying any online discussion of a gender-related issue. But these conversations leave out a powerful and invisible actor in our story. All of us, male and female, are unconsciously gender biased. And these biases lead well-meaning men and women to do things that perpetuate the status quo without our ever knowing it. So until as a society we can get our arms around this phenomenon, we are unwitting accomplices in the perpetuation of inequity and discrimination. So let's take a look at the brain processes that drive bias, how it shows up, and most importantly, what are some things that we can do about it? Most people think that they move through their day making their decisions with a conscious and rational process of deliberation. And by this logic, it's difficult to do something that's out of keeping with your values without knowing that you've done so. But actually, conscious decision making represents a tiny, tiny fraction of what goes on in your brain. You couldn't possibly take in the oncoming barrage of information moment to moment, process it, and formulate a response to it with this part of the brain alone. It needs help. And what it calls on is a vast reservoir of unconsciously stored associations. You see, as you move through your day, Outside of your awareness, your brain is always scanning for repeating patterns. And when it finds them, it stores them as the way things are or ought to be. But the problem with this process, which actually works well most of the time, is that your brain is also not differentiating around the utility or the fairness or the accuracy of what the environment is serving up. If it's associated out there, it's likely to become associated in here. And it is these associations that we use to make meaning of the world and to formulate our response to it. Now, we can measure unconscious associations quite easily with an elegant and simple instrument called the implicit association test. Quite simply for gender, all it does is ask you to associate certain words with the image of a man or a woman. And when those uh, requested associations match your unconscious association, you're going to be able to do these tasks more quickly and with fewer errors. So most people in the population, as it turns out, male or female, regardless of political orientation, have an easier time associating words like leader, strong, protective toward men, and nurturing, emotional, and fragile toward women. 16 million people have taken the implicit association test to date, and the results are clear. If you grew up here in the United States, or for that matter, most parts of the world, you likely have a significant degree of gender bias. Okay, so where do those biases come from? I mean, where are all these associations hanging out? Well, just do a search on the internet for any profession and add the modifier male or female in front of it and see what comes up. In this case, the search was on female executive. And as strange as the second image is, the most troubling one for me personally at my age is the last one because the subheading is aged female executive. Yeah. It comes from the things we receive from social media. In this case, uh, a recommendation of the top minds and big ideas that I should be following. There are 22 images, and only two of them are female. It shows up in the notoriously lopsided gender ratios at professional conferences. And even the backgrounds tell a story. It also shows up in headlines. In this case, Fortune magazine felt it necessary to reassure us that Marissa Meyer is the real deal, because as a blonde, attractive young woman, we might assume she wasn't. So media is not benign, because it is this sort of imagery that our brains use unconsciously in our calculations of who belongs where and what competence looks like. 
A Yale University study looked at bias in the hiring for the traditional, traditionally male role of police chief. And in this study, purportedly gender-blind participants were asked to review two applications. Now, when no names were attached, they overwhelmingly preferred the uh, application that had more education. But when a male or female name was attached, they overwhelmingly preferred the application with a male name. And this sort of result has been replicated in numerous other academic studies. But these unconscious biases don't just cause discrimination. They also influence our life choices. A University of Washington study recently looked at the effect of classroom decor on the choice of academic discipline. So researchers decorated two classrooms. One of them had kind of traditionally nerdy male paraphernalia in it, like Star Trek posters and comic books and video games. And the other one had neutral objects, like coffee cups and plants and art posters. What they found was that female college students who spent time in this traditionally nerdy classroom exhibited a markedly lower preference for computer science as a field than the females who spent time in the neutral room. But for males, it made no difference whatsoever. When you really look, this kind of bias shows up everywhere. It's in what we choose to share with whom and whose opinion we seek. It infects our assumptions about who should do domestic chores and who deserves the praise for doing so. It shows up, yeah. Uh, it shows up for that lone female on the technology team when her recommendations are disproportionately overlooked or second-guessed, but she can't say anything about this, and the phenomenon will likely remain invisible to her male colleagues. Why? Because to do so is potentially career-limiting. It marks her out as that woman. You know, the one that plays the gender card. So, it shows up everywhere. It shows up in our definitions of leadership and when vulnerability and sharing credit are seen as weak and when taking up space and personal ambition are seen as strong. Gender equity is not a woman's issue. We need women to fully participate in the conversations that shape the future of the world. But it's not just women who benefit. Men benefit too, because when we associate masculinity with money and muscles and domination and aggression, we dishonor legions of good men who do not embody these characteristics. No piece of legislation or mandatory sexual harassment training or quota will get rid of unconscious bias. These things are necessary. But when we focus only on overt sexism, we miss the point. And worse yet, we allow ourselves to point our finger at a hypothetical bad guy out there. But when we allow ourselves to understand that we are biased too, we're able to transform this conversation from one of blame and shame to one of committed action. Believing in gender equity is not enough. We are the creators and the consumers of the environments that drive bias. So what can we do about it? There's actually a fairly simple solution, and that is to commit yourself to becoming a good observer of your environment. Make it a daily practice, and if you need to, remind yourself. In fact, you might even notice something today as a result of the last 10 minutes we've spent together, but if you do, don't judge it, because we all do it. Don't judge it. Engage with other people. Get curious. And use it to fuel an exploration. When you see bias or the environments that drive it, say something, talk about it, and where you can, change it. And this is for the men in the audience. Women can't and shouldn't take this one on by ourselves. We need you to pick up the mantle alongside us. So let's help each other. Let's help each other change these limiting narratives of what it means to be a man or a woman. Because nobody here is to blame for this problem, but we are all together responsible for a solution. Thank you.
All right, I hope that gave you some really good food for thought, things to think about when it comes to this issue. Let's go ahead and go back to our PowerPoint here. And as we look at it, I asked you to think about as you watch the video, what some of the key concepts or insights or learnings you gained were. So if you haven't jotted those down or did not jot those down while you're watching the video, please make sure to do so now. Again, these notes are just to help you kind of write your reflection that's due Tuesday, it's just a one paragraph reflection. So now that we've looked at gender equity in the brain, let's look at some barriers that go a little bit deeper than or beyond what was shared in the video. So some barriers that are cultural in nature are the restrictive gender norms and roles that are often assigned by culture. For example, some cultures might expect girls' roles as staying as home, staying at home and doing housework and boys' roles as workers. Um, even in my own family, I feel like this is very true. My um, four older brothers got to do all the yard work, got to be outside, got to do all the manly type activities, whereas I was stuck inside um, sweeping the floors, vacuuming, dusting, ironing my dad's shirts, all those women type of jobs or girl type of jobs. So it's very frustrating now that that stereotype was perpetuated even in my own family. Um, the boys may be valued over girls. This um, idea and concept is very true when it comes to my own husband and his family. He is the oldest of four males from Mexico. His mother very much loves all of her children, but there's a special spot in her heart for her oldest, who is my husband. And if you look at the wedding pictures, um, 25 years ago, my mother-in-law was not happy that I had taken her baby boy away and I was going to keep him in the United States. I think 25 years later, she's almost forgiven me, but there's still that idea of the boy being very much valued, especially the oldest boy in Mexican culture, for sure. So let's go to the economic barriers as well. We kind of heard a little bit in the video that was shared, but earning potential males versus females is definitely something that's a barrier, especially when males are being paid more than females. There's pressure on males to support the family, just in a lot of cultures, that stereotype of the man brings home the the money or the bacon and the, the women are kind of there to take care of the kids and support the family. Um, this can also be seen in examples where you might have children missing school because girls, if they're an old, they have younger siblings, they might be asked by the parents to stay home and take care of the siblings if they're sick or if they need um, to go out and do something, the girls might have to stay home. And finally, there can be a lack of investment in higher education. Some families or cultures are even economically We'll see this disparity among boys and girls, um, so it's something to very much to consider and think about. Okay, so let's look at what kids have to say about this idea or this concept of gender equity. As you're watching this video, I want you to think about the following. First, your reaction, and then were you surprised by anything the girls or boys said? And then how do you think these students learned what they did about gender equity? And what is your role going to be as a future teacher to ensure gender equity? So again, I'm going to escape out of here and let's go to our videos. So move this over. Okay, so we're going to now watch how to teach children about gender equality. <laughs> Boys can run fast. Girls are good at smiling. Girls are good at giggling. <laughs> at first watch, these New Jersey 5th and 6th graders seem to be spouting stereotypes about the differences between boys and girls. Girls, I know, like to wear makeup, a lot of them, and boys don't. Boys usually tend to be better at sports. Boys are usually stronger and, or faster, or that's what my brother likes to say. Uh -huh. Do you think that's true? It's kind of true, but sometimes a girl could be stronger than a boy. Dig a little deeper and you'll find those cliches are being rejected and certainly wouldn't be part of any message they would deliver to their own children. When you're a parent, would you tell your kids that girls and boys are different? No. Yeah. Do not exclude anybody just because of their gender. Boys are good at singing. Girls are good at singing. Some girls are better at some things, and some boys are better than girls at other things. Girls are good at sports. Boys are good at sports. I don't care what anyone says, just do it. People, if they see a boy doing the necessarily, like, oh, what the? 
You could do that if you wanted to. Yeah. Or a girl playing football, that would be fine. Like the election, that was a great thing. There was a boy versus a girl. And you don't look at their gender. You look at who they are as a person. We both, we both like sports. We both, both like school. We both, both like art. See? We're more alike than different. <laughs> Okay, once again, this is a great example and video. I hope you enjoyed it, kind of, sorry, kind of hearing about um, the different viewpoints children can have on gender equality. One of the questions I asked you to consider, though, as we watched this, was how you think the students learned um, about gender equity and how they've kind of changed or transformed from what they were saying in the beginning of the video to the end. So hopefully you have some good notes on that and can kind of share that in your reflection as well. One of the things I think that really is important to help students learn about gender equity is to really address the hidden gender biases in curricula. In order to do that, some of the things you need to consider, and I would encourage you to maybe look at this in your own practicum classrooms, is do the text used in the classroom omit girls and or women or tokenize their experiences? Are females or males presented in stereotypical gendered roles in any of the textbooks, particularly those basal readers that are required? Think about that real carefully. Do I discourage both female and gender and male gender stereotypes? So when you're interacting with students, do you discourage this? And do you see your practicum teacher or your CT teacher doing this? Finally, if you look around your practicum classroom, are there plenty of books with strong female protagonists? Or do the nonfiction books feature notable women and girls, not just men? So these are some questions to consider when you think about those hidden biases that can happen in the curricula. For our students to really become aware and address these issues of gender equity, I think we need to think about these within our own classroom and the subtle messages we are sharing with students based on these um, gender biases in curricula. Now we're going to look at another example. This is an example in practice kind of to help students really understand in a concrete way the disparities that can happen between boys and girls. So as you watch this video, think about what the example shows and how this example is maybe more powerful than just talking about the difference between boys and girls. How does it really show students in a concrete way um, these differences? And then even though the video tied to disparities in pay, how might you apply ideas from this example to help your future students engage in more meaningful discussions about gender equity? So these are questions to consider as you watch this next video. I'm going to flip back here to our video screen. And we're going to watch gender equality explained by children. So equality, equity kind of interchangeably used here. The video, I think, is a good example, though. So let's go ahead and watch this. Selma, jag heter Martin. Jag heter Ask. Jag heter Victoria. Jag heter Lars. Jag heter Felicia. Nu har jag en liten jobb till dig. Jag tänkte att jag skulle putta de blå ballarna i den ena vasen och de rosa i den andra. Okay. Ska vi ta de rosa i den och blå i den då? Nej. Kommer Blå i den då. Jeg er fint. Grunnen til at du har fått mindre enn Thomas, det er faktisk fordi du er jente. Det er kjemperart. Det er ikke bra. Det er skikkelig urverdig. Hva tenker du, Felicia? Vi har jobbet helt litt, og så får vi ikke det samme. Vi var like flinke, og vi burde få like mye. Hvorfor det? Fordi ellers så blir det urettferdig. 
Det er liksom ikke forskjell på jente og gutt, da. Jeg tenker at det er feil. Hvorfor er det feil? Jenter er ikke mindre verdt enn gutter. Det har ikke noe å si hvis man er gutt eller jente. Okay, another, as I said, good concrete example of looking at this issue. I think, in my point of view, it really helps students understand the differences subtly that we can make amongst boys and girls through a concrete example. So how did you feel this example was a powerful way to help students understand those differences between boys and girls? And even though it focuses on pay discrepancy at the end there, how might you use an example like this in your future classroom to help your students engage in more meaningful discussions like the children did at the end where they said, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl. Everyone should get the same if they did the same job, so they shouldn't be treated differently. So that's just a kind of a concrete example in practice. Our last thing we're going to look at um, is how you can take these ideas into your future classroom and really kind of address these. In the week five course module, I provide an additional reading for you. This is just a support for you. But in this module, you'll see that the article talks about different strategies and tips to promote gender equity in the classroom. For example, one of the sections talks about strategies for achieving gender equity in interpersonal relationships with and between students, strategies for achieving gender equity in discipline patterns, strategies for achieving gender balance curriculum, and then strategies for achieving gender equity and access and opportunities to learn. So these like little tip sheets within the article are really great. I hope you have a chance to look at them, kind of sift through them, and maybe use those as a resource in the future. So we're going to take one final look at how we challenge gender. As you watch this final video, think about the messages we send kids every day. How are we promoting, even inadvertently, those gender stereotypes or gender roles? And then how might you take what you learned from this video and apply it to your future classroom? So this is our final video. Once again, let me just pull this over to get to our video slides. And the title of this one is Toilets, Bow Ties, Gender, and Me. I think you'll really enjoy this one. I wonder what you first think when you see me. Perhaps it's something about my curls. People often mention them. Or, what a dapper little man. In my experience, one of the first things people do is assume I'm a boy or aren't sure whether I'm a girl or a boy. We do this to everyone. We assume what gender someone is based on how they look. And if we can't tell, we get confused. I say we because I do it too. It's ingrained. Our first decision and mostly unconscious. But why? Well. I'm Audrey, and if we're talking biology, I'm female. But I feel that it's more complex than that. For an entry point, let's look at my style. As you can probably see, I have a unique style. But I wasn't born wearing suits, bow ties, and flamingo socks. My style had to evolve, and it will keep evolving. And I think it gives some insight into my changing experience of gender. Here's a photo of me, before I started school, wearing a Star Wars top, <laughs> a skirt and sneakers, demonstrating to the world that I'm a girl. It's the skirt, right? We all know that sign. So at this age, I was just a girl who didn't really care too much about what I wore. It was functional and varied. This all took a different turn when I hit the age of five and started school. I remember one of my first days at school, and I was in the girls' toilets, when two girls I knew came near me and said, look, there's a boy in here. I looked over my shoulder, but there was no one there. So I asked them where. I realized they meant me. I was really shocked, as I'd only ever really been around people who knew and understood me. I felt upset and alienated. Eventually, this misrecognition started happening in public bathrooms as well, with adults assuming my gender. Often I would get things like, why are you in here? Or wrong bathroom. 
This eventually led to me being hesitant and tentative about even going to the bathroom in public. Mostly, people didn't actually say anything at all. They just stared at me. This felt and feels worse. At school, this happened increasingly often. But while many people in that situation might have started dressing more typically female in dresses with long hair or bows, I became more and more masculine presenting, wearing what we consider to be boys' clothes, because in them I felt most authentically myself. I was pretty adamant about just wearing male things. What that meant to me was no pink or even purple or any form of dress, skirt, or even glitter and frills. I didn't think of myself as a boy, but anything that was identified as female felt uncomfortable to me. I adopted the label of tomboy, which meant a girl that wore boys' clothes and played with boys' toys. To me, this avoided conflict. Tomboys are common, right? They're even considered a stage, as though we'll grow out of it. My parents never fought my insistence on avoiding dresses. They allowed me to choose what I wore because they believed it had no bearing on who I was. I started wearing shirts and bow ties to any slightly formal event. Here's a photo of me at six wearing a bow tie and made out of paper because dad was wearing his fabric one. As for my experience in bathrooms, I tried to avoid the problem by waiting until people left before I went in because otherwise I'd feel trapped. Until about the age of nine, when someone mistook me for a boy, I would reply confidently that I'm a girl. But eventually, it stopped feeling right. Instead of gaining confidence, the more it happened, I lost it. Girl didn't feel right, but boy didn't feel correct either. So what did I want? I'm not sure I really knew at the time. My friends started getting more and more into sports, but I was never sporty. I was a bookworm. If I were a boy, people would probably have said I was a sensitive one. They don't tend to use that term as much for girls, because it's what's expected. So I started hanging out with a group of girls. This didn't really alter my style, more my attitude to the word tomboy, which I grew to dislike. I started to realise I could still be a girl and wear typically male things. In my mind, I was still a girl because I didn't feel like a boy. At the age of eight, I travelled with my parents and the cast of our film, 52 Tuesdays, to the Berlin International Film Festival. 52 Tuesdays was partly about a mum transitioning from female to male. I imagine some of you are thinking, oh no, Audrey just got this gender confusion from her parents' filmmaking. But this gender questioning happened before they started considering it, and they say I've taught them as much about this as they've taught me. Anyway, in Berlin, I met Bart. Bart wore drapey black materials, high-heeled boots, nail polish and eyeliner. But he wasn't dressed as a woman. This demonstrated to me that I could be flamboyant and androgynous with my style. That my love of bow ties didn't need to exclude anything traditionally female. That year, when the film won the Crystal Bear Youth Jury Award, I took to the red carpet in eyeliner and nail polish. Here's a photo of me that night. Note the bow tie. I started to think of gender as something more dynamic. Gender was not your genitals, or even what you wore or acted like. And maybe it wasn't fixed? I'm going to take a second to pose a question to you. Why does it matter to you whether I am a boy or a girl? And if you think it doesn't, I'm going to really ask you to stop and think. Have you ever come across someone whose gender you just can't place? Have you wanted to know, even if you don't care either way, have you wanted to know what they are? For those of you who say, no, I'm totally comfortable not knowing. I don't use he or she when talking about them. I just treat them as a human without any gender identifiers. Well, that's impressive. It's hard to do. Just try and talk about someone for a minute without using gender terms. It's really difficult. This is Audrey. Audrey is a young person who doesn't identify as any gender. Audrey writes stories and they love writing. Audrey loves writing, not the stories love writing. Whoops. It's hard for all of us. We want to know because of our language and also, in my experience, it's because we treat men and boys differently to women and girls. And we want to know how to treat them. Sometimes I'm glad that people mistake me for a boy because I get to have real conversations with people. They ask me about my future and we talk about what I want to do. Often, when they find out I'm not a boy, they don't know how to treat me. My friends, who show more outward signs of being girls, often get called things like sweetheart or darling or love. 
people comment on how pretty they are. Recently, when I travelled overseas, I noticed a trend of gender-neutral or all-gender public bathrooms, which makes me feel so relieved. Having that choice makes me love going to the bathroom in public, and I love that I don't have to tell anyone what genitalia I own. Here's a photo of me in my sparkle pants, as I call them. They really added flair to my style, and they also really confuse some people about whether I am a boy, or even, possibly, make them uncomfortable because I seem like a very flamboyant, or even girly, boy. Though I don't think this is always easy, I'm so happy with the choices I made when I was younger to wear what made me feel good and that I felt expressed me, because I think I would be a much unhappier kid otherwise. I still get called a boy in public situations, but in terms of bathrooms, I try to go to the all-gender or unisex ones, or if I can't, I go to the disabled toilets although I do still use the girls' loos in school and sometimes in public. Using the girls' toilets, I never feel good, and I still have a tendency to go with someone else. Although I'm not labelled as a particular gender when I go to the disabled toilets, I don't feel great still, because it just reminds me that there are mostly no toilets for people like me, who don't identify within the gender binary, and that toilets are just another way we categorise people. <laughs> My style has evolved drastically since the Star Wars t-shirts and skirts of my early childhood, and I think it has a lot to say about how I now appreciate and consider gender. I've realised that for me, gender is a spectrum. What my ge gender expression and identity is, is entirely about me and not about how other people perceive me. I don't know how we deal with that in a world so desperate to define by gender. I'm going to leave you with that same question. Why does it matter to you whether I am a boy or a girl, or that I am in the wrong bathroom. Does it really matter to you which bathroom I use? Because it does matter to me. Would it hurt you not to know someone's gender because despite how uncomfortable it might make you feel, you assuming my gender makes me feel uncomfortable every day? All I'm asking is for you to just sit with that little bit of uncomfortable to make someone else feel better. Because it does matter to me. It matters to me when I walk down the hall with my friends and you say, hey girls, but it doesn't mean that I want you to make amends. I don't hold my grudges, but every time you say that, it smudges my happy thoughts into undefinable worlds. It matters to me when you say I'm a handsome lad because while you may be complimenting, it makes me question my inner vision of myself. So strangers sit uncomfortably while I tell you how my gender ranges from day to day, sometimes neutral, sometimes fluid, sometimes gentle, sometimes fierce. It doesn't make me a boy, but it doesn't mean that I'm realigning and I don't want to be redefining what it means to be a girl because I'm not a girl. So it does matter to me. Okay, once again, I hope you enjoyed that video. It's a very powerful example of the labels we put on our students, our children, people in society, and the implications that can have. So for this final um, reflection that I've asked you to do, I just want you to think about all the different videos we saw, the examples, some of the information I shared with you, and just write a one paragraph, five to six sentence reflection of some things you took away, what was really powerful to you or what impacted you, what kind of changed your thinking or gave you new insights. Once you have that statement, you can just write it down on a piece of paper, on a sticky note, on a 3 by 5 card. Just make sure to bring that with you to class on Tuesday. We'll use it as our starting point for discussion. And that will give you credit for have watching, for have participated in and um, completed our flipped classroom for this week. Thank you once again for your understanding. I really appreciate it. Um, I will not enjoy being poked and prodded, but knowing that the doctors are looking for a solution will really help me feel better and be better able to meet your guys' needs. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the snow, and I'll talk to you soon.